Take your Bible with me to Genesis 15, if you would. Genesis 15. That feeling of being in the dark and wondering why, this feeling is necessary. You understand that? It's necessary. It's God bringing us to the end of self. It's needed. His friend, at the end of self is where God begins. The end of self. God will not share his glory with anyone, including you. What he does in your life, he'll do at the end of self, at the end of you, at the end of your effort and turning it over to the God. See, at the end of what I can do, of what I can muster, at the end of that is the beginning of faith and what only God can do. See, at the end of the natural, the death of it begins God's work and the supernatural. So, so the sooner we remember what we declared when we, like some of these got baptized last week, when we were in the baptistry, what we declared before all, we went under the water, death to self, death to Gary life, death to last week, uh, Justin life. Uh, when we went under the water, we were saying death to that life and now rising to walk, and the preacher said, to walk in newness of life. That comes from Romans. Uh, the reason for that is what we're saying is I'm no longer doing what I can do, but now I want my life to be about what God can do. And we say that publicly at that time, but we really don't fully understand all that. But the sooner you and I come to realize and live what we declared that our life was going to be about, the sooner God can work in our life and do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Dr. Lee Robertson, who had the great church in Chattanooga, Highland Park Baptist Church, said the book that changed his life was a little book called When Did You Die? When did you die? And it's taken from that passage in John where it talks about the Lord Jesus said, if a grain of wheat, except a grain of wheat fall on the ground and die, it abided alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Of course, you're speaking about his own life, but you and I, the same is true. If we don't die to self and die to us, the Holy Spirit of God can't have control. And God doesn't kick the door down and force himself in your life and your decisions but he says he knocks, he desires to have entrance. I'm not talking just about salvation, I'm talking about every moment, every day, who is gonna lead? Am I gonna to die to self and live to God? See, Jeremiah 33, three says, call unto me and I'll answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. But we don't call until we realize it's too great for us. And so may God help us to learn soon that we can do nothing and he can do everything. As long as you and I think, I've got this, then God doesn't go to work. But when we will lead in him, when we think all is under control, totally different. But when we will lean on him, God then can begin to help. And praise the Lord, he will. At that moment, we recognize our inadequacy and look to him, God can go to work. J. Hudson Taylor, his pictures out here on the hallway, the great missionary to China, uh, established a China Inland Mission there. Well, during the Boxer Rebellion in China, you can look it up, what was going on in China at that time. The China Inland Mission suffered greatly from that. And the founder, J. Hudson Taylor, during that time said to a friend, he was at a low point, he said to a friend, I cannot read, I cannot think, I cannot even pray. He said, but I can trust. I can trust. And listen, when you can't even pray, when you can't, the Bible says, we can look to Jesus. You remember that great story when those fiery serpents were biting the children of Israel, made that brazen serpent up on a pole. And the Bible says those that look will live. Now, you don't have to crawl to it. You don't have to kiss it. You don't have to reach for it. If you'll just look, the look of faith, the, the least possible thing, just believe, look. And the same is true for us, friend. All I can do sometimes is look at him. And that was a dark time for Hudson Taylor. But God eventually gave light. And here we come in Genesis 15 to this same type of thing in Abram's life. And it is the type of thing that every one of us must go through if we're going to learn the victory of the victorious Christian life.
If we're going to learn the Christian life that Jesus died for us to have, he said, I came not just to give you life, but life more abundantly. What is this abundant life? It's the Christ life. But it only happens when we die to flesh, when we put self to death. And that's the hardest thing. Because you and I, we love self. We love our way. May God help us. Abram here is coming to this. We're in when that series in Genesis, In the Beginning God, and we come to hear, listen to one of the high points of all Scripture. In fact, there's a verse in this text we'll look at in just a minute that there's three chapters in the New Testament to explain that one verse. It's quite something. Genesis chapter 15, would you join me? We're going to read it. The Bible says, after these things. Now, you remember what just had happened? All these kings had got together four against five and fought and, and, and Sodom and Gomorrah, their king, had lost and Lot's been taken captive. And, 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 and Abram and his servants go, the 400, and, and overtake all of that and recover all the people and all the spoil. And then he meets Melchizedek, this picture of the Lord Jesus, as Hebrews tells us. What an event has just taken place. He doesn't take any of the, he said, I won't even take a shoe latch. He doesn't take any of the spoil. He doesn't want anything that's tainted with Sodom. And after these things, verse 1, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Do you understand this is the first time in the Bible the, this phrase, word of the Lord, is used. The word of the Lord came to him. Now we'll hear that many times throughout the Bible, but this is the first time it's mentioned in the scriptures, it'll be used a hundred times, more than a hundred times in the Old Testament alone. But listen, the faith that conquers all fear, all types of fear, is faith not in feelings, but faith in the word of God. Oh, I love this. This is also the first time you find the phrase fear not in the Bible. Fear not. Now there's whole Psalms that'll talk about fear not. And, and the Lord will say, fear not to Moses and fear not to Joshua and fear not to Isaac and others. Fear not. But this is the first time. And he's reminding him, I love this. God's remedy to Abram's fear was to remind him who he was. He says, I am. I am thy shield. I want you to know what we need this morning is to be reminded of who he is. Who he is. I don't know what your fears are, or what you're dealing with. But friend, God's I am is perfectly adequate for all of ours I am nots. I can't. I'm insufficient, but he can. He is sufficient for all things. Oh, Psalm 46, 10, the Bible says, be still and know that I am God. Oh, please get this. Warren Wiersbe said, your life is only as big as your God. If you spend all your life looking at yourself, you'll get discouraged. But if you look to God by faith, you will be encouraged. Oh, I love that. He says, I am thy shield, Abram, and thy exceeding great re reward. He says, I'm your protection, your shield, and I'm your provision, your reward. He's enough. Listen, he's more than enough. Oh, he's the treasure. He's the great reward. Verse 2. And Abram said, Lord God, what will thou give me? Seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born of my house is mine heir. And behold, here we have again, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad. I don't know what that means. I don't know where God took him or if God miraculously took him where he could see on some mountain. We just have what it says here in verse 5. And he brought him forth abroad and said, look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. Here's a man that has no children. Think of this. He's nearing 100. No children. And God's saying, you understand? This is what you'll be. If you look at the natural, you think that's impossible. But God is the God of the supernatural. See? And God is at work in Abram's life like he's at work in our life to get us to quit trusting the natural and look to the supernatural. 
Quit trusting ourselves and what we could work out or produce and trusting God and what he can do. Wow, I need that lesson. Verse six, and here's this kind of high mark climax verse in Genesis. Really for all the Bible about the Lord Jesus and the gospel. Verse six, and he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. This is salvation here. We'll say more about it in a minute. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, take me an heifer of three years old and a she goat of three years old and a ram of three years old and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst and laid each piece one against another. But the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, talking about Egypt, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, and thou shalt be buried in a good old age. It'll be 175. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites. And the Kenizzites, Byron Fox was talking about the Kenizzites, remember last week, Joshua was a Kenizzite. Here it is, interesting. And the Cadmonites, and the Hittites, and the Perizzites, and the Rephims, and the Amorites, and the Mennonites. Oh, I'm sorry, that does not say that. And the Canaanites, and the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. I just seen if you're paying attention. Genesis 15, let's pray together. Lord, help us as we look at your word. Oh, how we need you. Thank you. For this great passage. Oh, help us. Give us understanding of the meaning. I know even for me this week, you've shown me things and I've learned from this passage things I'd not known prior. Thank you for your word. Teach us now, we pray. Oh, for the one here that may be lost without you, I pray that today would be the day of their salvation. Moved by your spirit through your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to bring you this title this morning. Abram seeing reality. Abram seeing reality. We live in a world that would think they know what reality is. In fact, they would say of me and you that you and I are not living in reality. But the truth is, as you study the Bible, this life is like a vapor. How many had coffee this morning? Come on, spiritual people, praise the Lord. How many had tea? Okay. Yeah, you all know what a vapor is. I mean, it comes off just for a moment and it's gone. God says that's what your life's like. If you think this is reality, if this is what your existence is all about, then it's a short, frail, filled with heartache, unfortunately, many times because of death and disease and all the things that come with sin. It's a short existence. The word of God helps us to understand that this life isn't about this life. This life is about the next life. And reality is us understanding that God made us. And God made us with a great purpose. And it's to live his purpose in this life so we might know and experience him and his glory in the next. Oh my goodness. This is reality. Well, Abram here, his life isn't about wandering. He made a great decision of faith and he, he obeyed God and left Ur of the Chaldees and now he'll be a pilgrim. He'll live in a tent, a tabernacle the rest of his life. And it was a picture all the way through his life that his life wasn't about this world. And Hebrews would give a testimony of his life that he looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. Meaning his life was about nothing of this life, but about that life. And he found that city, by the way, the heavenly Jerusalem where the builder is God. 
Remember, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll come again. He's prepared the place and Abram is there right now. But that was his life wasn't about just wandering and shepherd and shepherding and all the sheep and the, uh, uh, all the things he amounted. It wasn't even about a son, Isaac. It was about the heavenly Isaac that would come through that line. And so God was helping Abram in this chapter to see reality. See the Lord Jesus. We'll see that in a minute. See Calvary. See God's great love for man and see why God created him. It wasn't for sheep or shepherd or silver and gold. It wasn't even just for family and having children. It was for more than all that. It was for God. It was for God's purpose. See, life is not about military strength. We see in verse 1, Life is not about reward or treasure or money. He says, after these things, the word of the Lord came into Abram in a vision saying, fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy seeding great reward. See, life is about God. Reality, real life is the faith life. Faith in God. See, things that are temporal will burn up, will be gone. But things that are unseen, the Bible says, those are the eternal things. Oh, my God, remove every hope in self, every hope in our flesh from ourselves, every hope in our resources, and bring us to where all of that thinking, all of that scheming comes to naught. It's put to death in our life. And that our hope, our only hope would be God. Our faith in him and him alone. If God doesn't do it, if God doesn't come through, it won't happen because only God and do what needs to be done in my life. Amen. See, that truth, that belief is exactly what God is bringing Abram to here. But you see, number one, Abram's comfort. Verse one, we just read it. Abram's comfort. The word of the Lord comes to him and says, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Now, this is the fourth time that God has appeared to Abram. Remember, God is developing his servant. He's developing this man and bringing him farther along. Never forget, God is far more interested in developing you through the trial, developing you through the trouble, the, the fire, than delivering you. Now, these things he's allowed for a purpose. And we want God to remove all of them, but God wants to strengthen us through it. You see, the, the hardest steel is the one that comes out of the hottest furnace. And so God is working our life to develop us, to make us more like him, to knock off everything that still looks like Gary and make it look like Jesus, to knock off everything in your life and that we would come to the image of Jesus Christ, that people would see us, they would see Jesus in us. And so here, Abram's comfort here, God is trying to bring you and I to himself and to all that God has for us. But that doesn't come through just easy times. Through the easy times, we all are prone to wander. Through the times where there's not much trouble, we all tend to get slack, get lazy. We, we're not diligent, but oh, when the disease comes, when something's wrong with our children, how we kneel and pray, and, oh God, please. Do you understand how God puts trials there? Because we need them. Because if not, we wander away from God. We ought to thank God for anything that causes us to get on our knees again and to plead with God again and to run to God again. And may God help us to learn to stay there. But how kind to God to appear him right here. Abram has taken a huge step of faith. I know in the text you can't see it all, but imagine with me now. Remember in chapter 14 what happened? In chapter 14, these five kings decided to go uh, war against four kings of the plain of Sodom and Gomorrah and these other kings of the plain here. And these kings, these four kings are very successful. And we read through, remember, I don't want to reread them because it's hard to pronounce all the names, but all the things they conquered on their way. And you know what people do when they conquer? They take everything nice and good, right? And so they had collected all this spoil. Then they came into Sodom and Gomorrah, which, by the way, remember why Lot chose the plain of Sodom and Gomorrah? Because it was very rich and people there were very wealthy and it was very appealing to the flesh because of all of that. And so these kings now have conquered Sodom and Gomorrah and taken Lot captive and taken all the goods and everything. And they've amassed this big amount of spoil from animals to gold, silver, etc. And Abram, with 400 trained men, when God's presence and power and blessing hand upon it, 
defeats all that these four king, five kings could not defeat, beats these kings that conquered all these things, and now he is in possess, possession of all this spoil. Now, put yourself in that place. Now you turn it all down. Achan, and we are all men, we are all mankind here, we all, Achan could not say no to one Babylonian garment, one little bit of silver, and one little bit of gold. You know how tempting that was for Abram here. It's all his, rightfully, he's conquered it. And yet he says to the king of Sodom, I don't want any of it. God helps him. We looked at that. Melchizedek meets with him and he says, my reward is from the Lord. What I'm looking for is from God. I don't want any of the tainted spoils and riches of Sodom. He takes none of it. It's not a shoe latchet. Nothing. And now you imagine on the long walk, the Bible says how far they chased them. I think to Dan as they're pursuing and defeating and conquering. And so now on the long walk back, you can imagine the king uh, of, of, of Sodom greedily rubbing his hands. He's got all this stuff back. What an idiot, Abram. <laughs> what a fool. Didn't take any of this stuff. He could have had it all. And he's so happy about what he gets to take home. And you can hear his cohorts, Aner and Eskel and Mamre. They got their portion of the goods that went with Abram to the conquer. And you can imagine as he walked back, the dearest thing to his heart, Lot, and his family, as they walk back, of course, Lot will choose to go back to Sodom. But you know, the reason Abram went was to rescue Lot and his family. So you know they walked back together. And we don't know all the conversation that went on, but you know what Abram did here? Abram heard Lot's children talking, the chatter, the laughter of kids. And Abram was reminded, I still go childless. I still don't have a child. And so Abram... Sodom, king, all of them are gone back. Lot's left them and gone back. Like I said, Aner, Eshkel, and Mamre, they've got all their goods and they've gone back to their areas and here Abram's left. What's my reward? And God comes to him. Maybe during the battle there was a time where he feared for his life. Maybe he thought he was going to lose his life and somehow miraculously... Uh, we might would say a stroke of luck, but we understand supernaturally, miraculously, God prevented him from dying in that battle. And God reminds him, Abram, I'm your shield. I'm the one that protects you. I sent Melchizedek right when that temptation was going to come to take all that stuff and protected you not to fall to the temptation of taking all that material gain. I'm your shield. And not only that, he says, don't think you didn't take anything. I'm your reward. I'm your exceeding great reward. You don't, you, you don't feel like you don't have anything. You have me. And I am more than enough. I'm the treasure. Boy, may God teach us that. All of us are giving our life, working so hard, working extra jobs, second things, doing all the things to get what we think might be treasure. I'm telling you, it's not the treasure. God is the treasure. He's the treasure. And Abram's learning that. God is saying it to him. I want to encourage you, Abram. Let me comfort you, Abram. I'm your exceeding great reward. And I want to tell you, friend, this morning, God is not a respecter of persons, and he wants you to have him, not in, just in salvation, but him be the desire of your heart. Oh, remember Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee desires thine heart. Oh, God. Is a wonderful Savior. He is the exceeding great reward. So we see Abram's comfort. Abram's comfort. You have me, Abram. Don't you love how God knows what we need and God shows up to speak to Abram right at this time? Encourage him. Say, let me tell you, you have me. There's nothing worth more. The longer I live, the more I'm convinced there's nothing more valuable to seek after than the Lord. There's nothing more valuable than to have God's blessing and favor on your life. Our nation's in the situation we're in is because we underestimated the value of the blessing hand of God upon our nation. We've thumbed our nose at God. We said we've rebelled against God. We said we don't want you, God. We said we don't care about you, God. And we're starting to lose the blessing hand. Now we're under the judging hand. And I'll tell you, look at a family, look at a business that start, loses the blessing hand if they had it and starts having the judgment hand. Oh, I'm telling you, friend, you want God's blessing hand on your life. 
And Abram's being reminded right here, this is their great reward. What a comfort. Secondly, I want you to notice, we're seeing four things this morning. Abram's comfort, now Abram's concern. His concern. You know, one of the basic lessons of the school of faith is God's will must be fulfilled God's way and in God's timing. You know his concern. Verse 2, and Abram said, Lord God. He's saying here, Adonai, Lord with a small O-R-D is Adonai, Master, Lord God, what wilt thou give me seeing I go childless? What wilt thou give me? You know, God did not expect Abram and Sarah to figure out how to have an heir. All he was asking was that they believe and obey him. I love this. I don't have to make decisions. I don't have to know all the answers. I have a shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd I shall not want. He leadeth me beside the still waters. The Bible says, and he leadeth me in a path of righteousness. You understand? You don't have to know how to do it and figure all of it out. You have a shepherd. All you have to do is follow him. Obey him. Oh, it's so simple, the Christian life. If we'll remove self and our scheming and our planning and say, God, I trust you. I believe in you. That's what faith is, see. Not trying to figure it all out on our own. See, again, as I mentioned in the introduction, this title here, Abram Seen Reality, God was waiting for them to be, the Bible will tell us, physically as far as childbearing would go, for Abram and Sarah to be as good as dead. Wow. Meaning, all the childbearing years, you ladies that have gotten to this place, know it's the womb, it's time is over. You've gone through that menopause time, and, and, and the womb, that, that, that reproducing part of you is as good as dead. It's impossible. And that's where they're at. God is, was purposely getting them to the place that it was impossible naturally, physically, but it's never impossible with God. You understand? And the longer and the harder you struggle, the more intense God will have to get with you till you finally will wake up and recognize it's not about what I can do. It's about what I will let God do through me. I bring nothing to the table. He is the one that brings everything to the table. I'm a recipient of his grace. I deserve hell. Oh, I don't just need him for salvation. I need him for everything. It's all about him. Oh my God, help us to recognize and learn that. And the Bible says here, and Abram said, behold to me, hast thou given no seed, in verse three, and lo, one born of my house is mine heir, and here it comes again. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, this shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. Now, Abram's not learned the lesson yet, but God is helping him learn. He's learning. Abram's beginning to get, he's beginning to see reality. God reveals to Abram the plan that's going to come out of your own bowels. As David Livingston used to often say, it's the word of a gentleman, of the stricted, strictest and most sacred honor, and that's the end of it. If God says that it's the word of a gentleman, of the strictest and most sacred honor, and that's the end of it. Verse 5. And he brought him forth abroad and said, look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said to him, so shall thy seed be. Wow. Do you understand in that day, uh, they used to think there was 1,200 stars, about 1,200 stars. And then they thought it was a number more. And, and now we know what God was saying right here way back in Genesis, that the stars are innumerable. That's what God's saying to him. Tell me if you can count the stars. It's innumerable. Can't count it. Interesting enough, Sir James Jean, he said, there are more stars in space than there are grains of sand on all the seashores of the world. That's amazing. Think of that. Friend, you know, he's going through a difficult time. I love this about the stars, what, Jesus, what God says to him here. Even when life is dark, you can still see the stars. I like this. Someone well said, when the outlook is bleak, 
Try the up look. <laughs> look to the Lord. When Abram looked down at the dust, going back to Genesis 13, as God said, your, your uh, seed will be like the dust of the earth in Genesis 13, verse 16 there. Or if he looked up at the stars, Abram was constantly reminded of the promise of God and the power of God. You're going to have seed so many more than the dust of the earth, the sand of the sea, more than the stars of heaven. Look, whether Abraham looked down or up, God was encouraging him. And I want to tell you, God wants to encourage you today. He is almighty God. And God's promise to Abram staggered the imagination, but it was not impossible. Not to the God that created heaven and earth. Not to the God that flung the stars into space and the galaxies, the countless galaxies now we're finding out. Nothing's too hard for him. Nothing's impossible. And I just want to stop right here and say that the things in your life, the circumstances and decisions and what God wants to do in your life are all relying on God's power. And the building of Abram's life and family, his seed, was a work of God. And the building of your life for Christ and your heritage, your testimony is also to be the work of God. Not your own work. Us yielding to and cooperating with God's work. New Testament would say we are laborers together with God. The same power that flung the stars, the galaxies into space... The same power that created all things that we see in heaven and earth, set all things in motion, is at work in your life right now to bring to pass his purposes. Just like he was to bring Abram's purposes and Abram's life to bring it to pass. Now, I want you to remember now this seed in verse five is beyond physical. It's beyond physical. A New Testament chapters like Romans 4 and Galatians 3 and James 2 explain this. It's spiritual as well. It includes, this seed includes Jesus. We'll read in just a minute that you and I, we are part of the seed of Abraham if you're a born again Christian. I'm not talking about being a Jew. I'm talking about if you're a born again Christian, he's the father of all that believe, the Bible tells us. That gets us to point three. Keep in mind, it's not mere faith that saves, but faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that saves. Verse number three, we see Abram's conversion. Or Abram's conviction, if you will. Abram's comfort, Abram's concern, and now his conversion. Notice verse 6. So God has said these things that are impossible. And you and I, we would question, we would doubt, or we at least would be tempted to. But notice verse 6. And he, Abram, believed in the Lord. And he counted to him for righteousness. He believed in the Lord. Uh, turn with me, if you would, to Romans. Would you please? We'll not exhaust it. It takes three chapters in the New Testament to unpack that one verse. Okay, we're not going to exhaust it here this morning. But listen, promises do us no good unless we believe them. Can I say that again? Promises do us no good unless we believe them. Romans chapter 4. It's interesting, this first reference in the Bible right here, what we just read in verse 6, is the first reference of Abram's faith. And the Bible says... Abram is the father of all who believe. But this one verse is quoted three times. Uh, let me give you the references. We're going to look at Romans 4, 3. But there, it's also quoted in James 2, 23 and Galatians 3, 6. But notice Romans 4. Let's pick up in verse 1. Romans 4, verse 1. What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the Scripture? Abram believed God. Here it is. And it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Listen, you didn't come to a church that's going to tell you, try to do better and do a good job. And, and you can do a little better and work your way into heaven. If your good works, that way your bad works, you'll make it in. That's a lie. The Bible says right here, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. See, in the Bible, our, our sin is considered nakedness. Our good works are filthy rags. But the coat that takes to get into heaven, the wedding garment to get into the marriage supper of the Lamb, is the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Without that, no one 
gets to heaven. No one goes to heaven. See, our righteousness, our good works would never be enough. It's not by works of righteousness we have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved us. By the washing of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Ghost. For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. And none of us will pop our collar in heaven and say, that's right, I was good enough, got in. No, every one of us will say, I was a sinner. I deserved hell, but Jesus, see him with the nail-pierced hands, he died for me. He took my death, he took my hell, he paid for my sin on Calvary, and the reason I'm here is I, I believed. I believed. I said amen to what Jesus had done. I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and was saved. And notice verse, still in Romans 4, notice verse 16. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. Well, that's a great verse to study alongside Ephesians 2, verse 8. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. See, if it was of works, it wouldn't be by grace. Grace was something you don't deserve, something you didn't work for, something you, you shouldn't have received, but you were given just because of someone's goodness, in this case, God's goodness. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end. The promise might be sure to all the seed. Get this, to all the seed. Remember I said it wasn't just a physical seed. We're talking about a spiritual seed through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be of grace to the end. The promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he delivered, even God who quickened the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Don't you love that? Our God calls things that aren't as if they already were. He's talking about his seed and what's going to be to have a child. Jesus is 2,000 or thousands of years yet away. Verse 18, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Oh, I love it. Verse 22, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. What? All the work he did and get all these kids? No, that he believed God and God did all the work to bring all this seed and the father of many nations. So it was counted to him for righteousness. Back in Genesis 15, we see Abram's life here illustrates salvation by faith. Abram believed God, verse 6, and it was counted to him for righteousness. There's three key words here, believed, counted, and righteousness. Those are all repeated in the other passages I gave you. We read one of them, Romans 4, 3. But Abram believed God. And literally every commentary I read on this, almost without fail, and the commentaries you might would read on this would say the same thing. Literally, Abram said, God said, your seed are going to be like the stars of heaven. And literally, this is what the commentaries all said. Abram said, Amen. So God says, listen, Abram, let me tell you something. Listen, your seed, let me tell you about it. You're going to have a son out of your own body. And Abram said, amen. And he said, and Abram, your seed will be like the sand by the seashore. And Abram said, amen. And God said, and Abram, your seed will be like the stars of heaven I'm showing you here. And Abram said, Amen. Amen. This is why we should say amen when the truth is preached. Amen. It's biblical. That's literally what he's saying here. In fact, you read in the other passages of Scripture where the, they read the Bible and all the people said, amen. Why? They're saying, we believe this. This is true. Amen. It's actually one of the names of our God. He's the faithful and true. Amen. He is the amen. When we say amen, we're saying, I believe that. I believe God. That's true. And I believe it. And that's what Abram said. God said what he's going to do. And he said, amen, I believe you, God. The word believed here carries the idea of leaning your whole weight upon. Like a chair. You're leaning your whole weight upon. Abram literally put his whole weight 
on God. I give this illustration sometimes and when I'm witnessing, there's people in our city right here that would say they're going to heaven, but the truth is before God, they're lost and they're on their way to hell. I'm not the one that knows that or determines that, but religious people don't go to heaven. Saved people go to heaven. Amen. And there'll be people that say, Jesus said this, in that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did not we do all these sort of things? He'll say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Because we could say, I believe in this chair and it's a sturdy chair and it's a good chair, but we're not putting our weight on it. We're putting our weight on our goodness and our good works and our church membership. Our baptism even is a work. People trust him, but it's by faith, it's believing. Literally, Abram was believing. He put his whole weight, his whole trust, his whole belief in what God said. Put his weight on it. If his chair didn't hold me up, I'm not staying up. I'm going down. That's what he was saying. If God, if you don't do this, it won't happen. I believe you. I'm putting my whole oomph of my life, the whole belief of my soul behind what you have said. Hmm. Friend, I want to help everyone here understand if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, if you don't know for sure heaven is your home, your eternal home, listen, please, right now. Listen, the Bible is very clear. We are not saved by making promises to God. I'll never lie again. I want to be a better husband. We are not saved by making promises to God. We are saved by believing the promises of God. God said, I died for you. You're a sinner. You deserve hell because of your sin, but I don't want you to go to hell. So I sent my only begotten son for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish death and hell, but have everlasting life. Live forever in heaven with me. It's received by faith. Salvation is the gracious gift of God and it's received by faith, by believing, for by grace are you saved through faith. Believe, counted, righteous. This word counted has the idea of to impute. It's a banking term. It means to put on one's account. Our account was sin and God took that on Jesus on Calvary. His account was righteousness and we got that on our account when we put our faith in him. If you've not put your faith in him, it's not on your account yet. You still are carrying your own account. This is what the Bible says about it. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he, God, hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. If you don't know Jesus, your Savior this morning, I want to tell you, he wants you to have his account on your life. He wants you to receive the gift of salvation. For the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Abram, he said, amen. I believe this. Oh, what a testimony. And again, as I preached recently, Abram was not saved by obeying God or even promising to obey God, but his obedience proved his faith. See, and we're not saved by faith plus works, but we are saved by a faith that works. If we've truly been born again, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things that are above. It changes us, see, if you're truly saved. Now we see here God preaches the gospel and shows Abram the cross in some way and the covenant that God has made with mankind. You see, God was at work to secure Abram not only a seed, small s seed, but a seed, the holy son of God. Number four, lastly, Abram's covenant. Abram's covenant is confirmed here. Notice verse 18. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, unto thy seed have I given. He goes over the covenant of the land. And so God is teaching him. Now, as I said, Calvary is foreshadowed before Abram here, somehow by God. Through this, what we see here, this picture of these sacrifices being split up and divided in half. But all faith, all saving faith is ultimately faith that must come to rest on the finished work of Christ on the cross. So here he sees Calvary. I'm going to show it to you in a minute, but just take my word for it. He sees this in some way, his death, burial, and resurrection. Well, turn to Galatians. Let me go ahead and show it to you. Go look at Galatians chapter 3. 
Galatians chapter 3. If you're with me, say amen, would you? Amen. Good. Look at Galatians chapter 3. I want to help you here. Some of you, I'm sure, have read this passage and wondered, what is all this about? Why does he take these three heifers and three goats and three uh, rams and, and he splits them in the middle and lays them like this? I'm going to explain that in just a minute, but I want you to see what it means. Galatians 3, verse 6 through 9. Listen to it. Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. That sound familiar? Sound like Genesis 15, 6? Know ye therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham. This is that seed that goes beyond natural. The, the faith seed here, not just the natural seed. And the scripture foreseen that God would justify the heathen through faith. Notice this. Preached before. Before what? Before the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Before it had actually happened. Preached before the gospel. That's what the gospel is, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. You say, where did God preach before the gospel to Abraham? Right here. Right here he sees what the Lord does. In some way, at least in some small measure, he sees the horror of the cross was brought home to his heart here. Genesis 15, notice verse 12. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. Maybe some of that same horror of darkness that came on Calvary. When God the Son hung between heaven and earth. And the Bible says at noonday it was dark, black as midnight for three hours. When in that darkness, God the Son made a covenant with God the Father for all of our souls. He paid our sin debt. This darkness came upon him. Wow. Verse 7 and 8. And he said to Abram, I am the Lord that brought the other earth the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? I don't think he's asking in, 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 uh, in, in unbelief or doubting. God doesn't chide him or correct him like he would in other places if someone's doubting. I think he's just asking for a token of assurance. Listen, these people are occupying the land. It's one thing to own the land. It's another thing to occupy it. And he's saying, I know who's occupying the land. And what God meant, lists them all here in verse 19, uh, 20 and 21. These, these people groups that are occupying the land right now. Verse 9, and he said to him, take me a heifer. And I've read through this. And divide them, verse 10, divide them all asunder. So he, he sacrifices these sacrifices. And uh, he lays them all out there. And we have here what is called in their day, the cutting of a covenant. This is a common practice. In fact, Jeremiah 34, uh, you see it alluded to as well. And basically what they would do is make these sacrifices and they would take an animal and they'd cut it all the way and split it in half. Half on this side and half on that side. They split these animals. And this was a common way. This was like going to the courthouse and having something notarized, an agreement made. And this was a common legal transaction in their day. And then the two contracting parties would take hand in hand and walk betwixt between these sacrifices, showing that what they've agreed upon, whatever they've co contracted together, that they are both in agreement under penalty of death. And they will deserve the same penalty or the same death that has happened to these animals will be on them if they break the covenant. So this is what's happened. If someone had walked by in that day and said, hey, Abram, what is all this? And here he's chasing away the birds. God, I'm making a covenant with God. Well, God didn't show up. No, God's coming right on time. He just told me to get everything ready. God's always right on time. But here he's waiting on God. And finally it gets about dark. And the Bible says God causes a great sleep on Abram. Reminds me of the great sleep God put on Adam. This great sleep on Abram. A few of you have. Have that great sleep come on you right here. I'm looking at you. <laughs> yeah. What happens? Well, Abram doesn't walk through. By the way, someone wants to know what the birds are. The devil's the prince in power of the air, and the birds are often used examples of demonic spirits in the Bible, trying to interrupt what God's doing. But now it's time for these contracting parties to walk between. This is the time. But God paralyzes Abram, if you will, here. Verse 12, this deep sleep God causes to come upon him. This horror of great darkness comes upon him. That seems rather odd, but it's because God is promising 
something. But Abram is not promising anything. See, God is promising something. God's promising he's going to do something. Abram's not promising a thing. And Abram believed God. That's all. See what happened 2,000 years ago? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You and I, I wasn't even alive 2,000 years ago, and neither were you. I wasn't there to make a covenant, but God the Father made a covenant with God the Son. And the covenant does not depend on me or you. The covenant depends on God alone. Hebrews 6.13, let me give you this verse, you will write it down. Hebrews 6.13, for when God made promise to Abram, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself. See, if our covenant with God was dependent on Abram or any other man, it would have ended because none of us can keep our word. How many times you said you weren't going to do something, you've done it again. I'll never do that and I've done it. I'll not do, I'll do that and then you failed to do it or whatever. We can't keep our word. We would have messed up. And you and I, when Jesus was on the cross, we were paralyzed, if you will, in our sin. I couldn't promise anything. He made all the promises. All my part is to do is say, amen. God paid for my sin on the cross. He died, was buried, rose again. The Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, if you'll say amen to that and believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, amen, thou shalt be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Our part is not to do anything except believe that God did his part. He's the one that made the covenant. Oh, wow. Wow, what a picture here. See, God and God alone made the promise. There are no conditions attached. The covenant of grace came from the generous heart of God. Salvation doesn't depend on my goodness. It doesn't depend on my holding on to the end. Salvation depends on him and him alone. It depends on God alone. God said that he would do his part. And he's asking man to do just one thing. Say amen to him. Believe him. God wants you to believe him. God wants you to believe what he has done for you. Friend, to believe God is salvation. But someone wants to know why verses 13 to 16, why they're going to be a stranger land and serve people and, and why this. It's amazing in this chapter, I don't have time to develop it, but God pulls back the curtain in verse 16 and lets us see sometimes the why of what God does. Can you imagine this? Abram, I'm giving you the lamb, but you can't have it yet because I love the Amorites. And I'm giving them enough time to be able to repent. He gives them 400 more years. Four generations it'll take until you can have the land because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. You say, why hasn't God destroyed wicked nations in our day? Why hasn't God destroyed our land for the wickedness that we have done? Because God is long suffering. Oh, we see a little glimpse here of hundreds of years of God's mercy. Aren't you glad God's a merciful God? 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but his long suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Listen, if you're not saved here this morning, one of the reasons the Lord Jesus has not come back is because of you. He wants you to be saved. He doesn't want you to perish in hell. He wants you to know his love. He wants you to repent, turn from your way and turn to God's way. I believe in the death, burial and the resurrection of Christ. I believe what he did for me. I'm putting my full weight on it. In that day, verse 17 and 18, the Bible says, a dark, in the dark here, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp pass through those pieces. Both of them are pictures of Christ, I believe. The furnace speaks of his judgment that he'll suffer because of our sin on Calvary. The lamp speaks of him as the light of the world. In verse 18, in the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying, and he goes over all the marks of the land. By the way, what did Abram promise to do here? What did Abram promise? Nothing. Nothing. He believed God. And God will save you this morning. God will save anyone at any time. He'll give you a home in heaven. You could know that. You can have assurance of that. He'll save you by his grace if you'll simply believe what he's done for you. It is finished, he said on Calvary. It is done. All we have to do is believe. Trust. 
And those who put their faith in Christ enter into that covenant and receive eternal salvation, and eternal inheritance, and eternal glory. Oh, what a God we serve. What a God we serve. I'll not take a thread from a thread to a shoe latchet, Abram said. Abram said to the king of Sodom there last chapter. And God said to Abram, not just the well-watered plains of Jordan, not just the land of Canaan, but Sinai and Canaan and the Fertile Crescent and Arabia, it's all yours, all the way to the Euphrates River. God responded. <laughs> Think of that. An old farmer once said, as someone asked him how he had been so prosperous, he said, well, I made an agreement with God. I'd give him his share. I would shovel it into his bin with my shovel. And he would shovel it into mine. Only he has a bigger shovel. Abram woke from his sleep this day. This, this, this darkness, the fresh realization of how very big indeed God's shovel was. What a covenant. What a God. Oh, I love this chapter. When Abram said he was fearful about himself, God comforted him and said, I will, or I am, I am your shield. I am your reward. When Abram was concerned about his heir, God said, I will. From your own bowels, it's going to come. And God here meets Abram's concern about the land with his covenant. I have given. I didn't point it out, but it's in the past tense. I have given. And this, all this land. Have given. It's done. And in Jesus Christ, God gives us those same assurances to people today, friend. Abraham believed God. Do you believe? Will you believe? Will you bow your head in prayer?